So um, today we're going to try and go over, um, I guess, the history of testing at Salesforce. Um, talk about how we've taken our rather large um, automated testing system and um, expanded it out into the cloud. And then we're going to talk about um, how we're using Jenkins CI to do releases and how we kind of see the future of things as kind of Jenkins being almost everywhere within our company. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Tom to talk about, uh, I guess, the scale we're talking about and the architecture, since uh, Tom is now one of the chief architects in automation. Uh, hi, my name is Tom Kim. Um, I work on the automation team at Salesforce, and we uh, maintain uh, a system called the auto builds that runs all our builds and uh, tests. And at Salesforce, um, we've worked on this system for at least um, probably about uh, eight years. And it's a homegrown system. Um, we're a pretty large product. Uh, and one of the main things that sort of defines our R&D operations is that we take testing sort of maybe a little too seriously. Um, so we have a million, multi-million line code base. Um, we have several major release branches. Um, basically, there's the branches that are uh, in production right now the ones that are going to be released next, and then maybe a uh, main line. Um, <clears throat> we have a lot of tests. We have hundreds of thousands of tests. Um, most of these are tests that run inside the app server and the app server process as functional tests. Um, and if you ran each test one at a time, uh, one after the other, you know, with mul no multi-threading and whatnot, um, then it would take probably about 3,000 hours. We're on that order um, to run the tests and to end um, so obviously we, we don't run it like that. We run it multi-threaded and um, across many machines at the same time. Um, and we call the system the auto builds. And um, I'll show you a little bit more about how that system works. And it runs across many uh, machines. And we use virtualization pretty extensively. Um, and uh, so we have this large code base. We have a lot of tests. And then we have lots of changes going in every day. And so we our aim is to basically run all the tests against every change list um, continuously all day long. Um, and you can see how we uh, get something close to that. Um, I just want to add something. So I, I guess um, uh, architecturally, um, you know, we have our application code. And then all the QA people that we hire, are, we call them quality engineers, because they really do truly write um, software that allows us to, I guess, release and deploy. And so I think we actually have almost as many or maybe even more slots of test code than we do application code, right. just because um, sometimes it ends up being a little more verbose or expressive. Um, and we weren't always API-driven in architecture. You've got to realize the <coughs> code base, I guess, dates back to around 2000, 2001. Um, and so um, we do actually run a lot of the tests in the same JVM as the application server. Um, not all of them, but many of them. And so, um, you know, if we had been thinking about uh, like a Jenkins kind of architecture from the start, it would have been different, but this is sort of where we are, and that's why we use this proprietary system in order to run these tests and to get the results out. Yeah, it's really one of the keys to sort of the success of the product um, because customers really want sort of a reliable, kind of dependable functionality came out of the product, and we have a really wide range of functionality in the product at this point as well. Um, so from the developer perspective, this is sort of what developers see. Um, there are uh, what we call auto builds, and basically an auto build is um, a set of tests for a specific code line. Um, so uh, we sort of broke down the tests into different um, kind of groupings, um, and these re return anywhere between one hour to maybe five hours. Um, and this is for one particular code line, and the developers really depend on the system to you know, submit changes that can make really wide um, impact to the code base and to the product uh, and get feedback from all these within a reasonable amount of time about the impact of their change list against the entire product, um, against that multi-million line code base. Um, so this is a highly simplified uh, um, overview of what the system kind of looks like, um, uh, glossing over a lot of details. But basically, we use Perforce. People submit changes there. Um, we pick up those changes with this uh, process that continually pulls per force. Uh, this system is database-centric, um, so we have a database that's called the Luna database um, into which runs are inserted, and then we have um, a whole set of VMs, those 2,000 VMs, basically sitting and running this process called 
the Audible runner that pulls the database for runs. And on top of that, and then we have a web interface that um, everyone accesses the system through uh, called uh, Luna Web. And again, this is glossing over many details. Um, uh, one interesting part of our system, so when, you're, when you have change lists in the system, um, they go into UI looks kind of like this. On the left-hand side, you can see sort of all the different change lists. Um, and then you can see we ran about 100,000 tests on one of those change lists. And there were, in that um, stack, there were maybe 39 test failures. One of the um, characteristics of our system is that there's too many uh, changes and too many tests for us to actually run all the tests against every change list. And so one of the shortcuts we take is that we basically run them as fast as we can, um, but we still end up skipping many change lists. So those change lists are essentially sort of bashed into uh, the change list at the top. And um, at the sort of number of developers that we have, the number of changes that are going in, that feedback um, is kind of useful to say that there were 39 failures and it's one of the, the cause is one of the six people that submitted into this batch. Um, but that's not actually good enough for the number of developers that we have. So we actually go back through every other change list that we skipped and rerun just the test that failed. And we call that partial runs, um, but it's really about correlating uh, the failures on a per change list level. Uh, so, you know, the old system was actually. Uh, yeah. Yeah, flaky tests are a really big problem for us. Um, it's, we call them flappers because basically the test flaps. So from run to run, um, you have a test that will pass and then it'll fail and pass and it'll fail. And uh, we have like a whole line of uh, investigation that we've done into that. And there's sort of different reasons why that happens. Um, some are purely test code issues. So it's really easy to write a, a test that's sort of non-deterministic like that. So the sort of simplest example is, you write tests that inserts rows into the database, you query for those rows, you get them back, and you assert that you get the five back, but they're always gonna come back in a different order because the database doesn't, unless you have an order by statement, isn't gonna give you a deterministic order. And so developers write tests like that routinely. Um, the tests that are like that, where it's purely in the test code, our thinking is that basically those are just, those are pretty much just test failures, and we have mechanisms in place, um, and you can't really see that here, but, um, to basically try to detect those. We'll run the test twice. We'll run the same test over across um, with, with no changes. Um, and we'll look at the pattern of tests passing and failing across multiple runs. And we actually uh, will try to detect that in the system at this point. Um, and then there's other sorts of reasons why tests flap around like out of memory issues, um, out of um, you know, uh, you know, slow performance of the VM and whatnot. And we have other ways of detecting those basically. Um, so this is, uh, so the old system we had sort of statically provisioned VMs and, um, or sorry, st yeah, statically provisioned VMs uh, and in sort of the modern system that we have right now, we use uh, sort of dynamic VM provisioning pretty extensively. So uh, basically uh, we use, so our system that's in our data center is based on VMware and we use, um, make heavy use of the VMware API and we have a process that basically looks at the workload coming into the system, and then we'll provision VMs uh, uh, to run you know, the build runner on all those VMs. And it's dynamic, so it can look at sort of the state of the system um, to tear down machines um, and set up new ones. And uh, in a simple sense, we sort of basically try to take a, get, create a new VM for every run, so that guarantees sort of a clean state. And we use the VMware API for this. So uh, a project that I've been working on for the last um, year or so is actually to take that system and actually migrate it to the cloud. Uh, so we actually use Amazon Web Services for a system that's actually pretty similar. Um, it has the same logic of looking at the workload um, that's in the system right now and then provisioning machines in response to that workload, provisioning the software, uh, provisioning the uh, build runner code, and then launching those. Um, uh, the way that system works, to, to add a little more detail, is uh, 
we, one of the challenges there is that um, to provision an instance of our application um, is actually pretty heavy. Um, not only do you need the code and the, and the, and the database images, um, uh, well, so the code and the database images collectively are, are like many tens of gigabytes. Um, and so we provision it in two steps. We do one step overnight where we create what are called base images that have sort of a baseline state from that night of, of the schema. Um, and we use those base images to actually provision the runtime instances that actually will actually run the builds and the tests uh, during the day. And uh, because we have those baselines, in VMware has a pretty cool technology called link clones that we use that allows you to create many link clones very quickly, pre-provisioned with many gigs of data on them. And um, on EC2, we just use um, EBS, uh, S, you know, EBS, uh, EBS backed AMIs. Yeah, yeah, that's a good uh, good question. So, um, yeah, the EC2 instances are generally slower, uh, which is um, sort of a trade-off we make. Um, you can get them arbitrarily fast, but you just have to pay a lot more. Um, and so we spent a lot of time kind of trying out the different instances, seeing which one gave us different kinds of performance, um, you know, at different costs, and sort of figuring out which which instance type we needed, and so they have they have different series of VMs. They have VMs that have more memory, or VMs that have more CPU. Um, the best all around VM for us, I think, that we're using right now is M2.2x large. M2.2x large for each VM, which is actually pretty expensive. Right. So I've uh, glossed over that. So, so a given run. Like you know, like a given full run runs across, depending on uh, which uh, test suite it's running, uh, will run across as many as say 40 VMs. Uh, and on a single VM, we have both uh, app, server, or app server and database deployed. Obviously, in production in real life, the architecture is totally different. But right, so. Most of our tests are structured um, around, uh, operate within the context of what we call an organization. So Salesforce, uh, the Salesforce sort of model um, sort of has this notion of multi-tenancy where we have all of our customers residing in one database and every customer has their own um, sort of view into that database. It's called an organization within which all their data resides. And uh, the test leveraged that system that we already had in place. Um, uh, to make the tests have some level of isolation. And so every test basically creates its own org. So the idea of the test which are totally Right, every test will operate in, within its own org. And the app, sort of out of necessity, really, um, organizations always um, operate in a way that's isolated from every other organization. So, you know, if the, you know, what's happening in the Cisco organization doesn't happen, affect what's happening in the ADP organization. And similarly, what's happening in this test isn't going to affect what's happening in this test. Assuming everything's working okay. Uh, for the build itself, yeah, we have we use AND and IV. Yeah, well, we're sort of evaluating both of these actually right now. So we have a pretty extensive VMware system. The EC2 system uh, is definitely more expensive, like um, just in purely sort of do dollar terms, I would say right now. Um, uh, but there are there's trade-offs because um, they're actually pretty different, the systems, because um, when you have VMware, you are building a full stack. You're you're bringing in hardware, you're setting up the hardware, you're building, you're building out the network, um, you have the clusters, um, the storage networking, the storage, and, and your code is actually writing to those things too because your code is going to be which host should I go to, which cluster should I go to, how much free space is there on this cluster, how much free space is on the SAN. And when you write the EC2 code, it has none of that. It's just give me a VM. 
And so they're actually pretty different, and there are trade-offs in the sort of the development process. Um, so yeah, it's something we're sort of looking at. Yep. Yeah, largely, um, I guess there's a couple different kinds of environment, environmental issues. One is, um, uh, well, it's like the simple, at the simplest level, we, we provide a new VM for every uh, test run. So that's the basic way that we provide um, stability within the environment. And we have, the provisioning process itself is pretty deterministic. Um, and then the, over the course of a test run, we have stability issues where things run out of memory and whatnot. And those we sort of just have to sort of see what issues arise and fix them as they come up. All right, so in this system right now, we're not using um, uh, Jenkins extensively, and Greg's going to talk about systems where we do use Jenkins, um, and we'll likely incorporate Jenkins into some pieces here, um, but this is homegrown right now. Yeah. So All the tests are JUnit based. Yeah. yeah. Um, as far as managing test cases, we have sort of homegrown systems uh, built on the Salesforce app to manage test uh, cases and all that. Yeah, we sort of have separate systems around test case management like the, that you're talking about. Um, we have a, I forget what we call it, but uh, it's, um, we record that kind of information about manual test executions and whatnot in a, an application that someone built um, on top of the Salesforce application, because it's the kind of thing you build on the Salesforce app. It's like a database of all the tests and all that. Right, we're not doing that right now. But uh, when we talk about things that we want to do in the future, this is some, one of the things that we're looking at doing. So I'll just keep going here. Um, so yeah, VM provisioning has some interesting parts to it. Um, uh, just that system that, that we saw around provisioning in, in EC2 and provisioning uh, in VMware, um, there's some complexities to how we want to allocate uh, the instances. So sort of the basic function is that you have an input, which is your workload, um, which is sort of you know how many changes are there, how many runs are there, how long are those runs going to take, um, how many partial runs are there, and so on. And then you have an output, which is how many VMs do I need uh, based on my workload. So you know, for example, overnight, maybe no one's checked in any code, and so you may not need any VMs. Uh, during the day, everyone maybe checks in like at 11.50 before they head out for lunch, and so you need a lot more VMs. And so there's some logic around how we compute um, how many VMs you need in response to the workload. And in VMware, uh, the sort of problem is sort of has one flavor to it, and in EC2 has kind of a different flavor to it, because in EC2 you're trying to, in, in the VM, in, the, in, the, in our uh, sort of on-premise environment, we sort of want to maximize the utilization of the hardware that we have. And in the EC2 environment, uh, we actually want to try to save money. And so the goals are sort of different in those two contexts. And so the simplest system is sort of what you might call stack allocation, where you basically say, you know, these audibles should have such and such number of VMs. And you just always try to maintain a pool of that size. Um, and then as you get more sophisticated, you have dynamic allocation that says, you know, you know when there's no work, provision fewer VMs or when there's, there's less work, provision fewer VMs. Um, and then along those lines, then you sort of have to correct, and you have, you have, have to have predictive allocation, which we haven't actually implemented, but which we're thinking about, where you provision fewer VMs, but there's going to be a lot of work coming in the next hour. There's various ways that we might know that. And so provision, so provision some VMs preemptively so that you're ready to go as soon as that work comes in. And then elastic allocation is sort of the idea that um, over the course of the release cycle, you have to sort of reallocate because you might have more work coming in, say, at the end of the release cycle. And so not only do you want to underallocate when there is less work to be done, but when there's a particularly uh, lot of work to be done, then you want to actually overallocate and allocate more. Yep. Um, they're basically identical. Um, there are differences between different code lines, so different code lines get different code bases, basically. Um, so they're actually different. Uh, for both environments, it's about five minutes. 
most of that is just boot up time. The VM configurations, um, they're basically just uh, arbitrary shell scripts that you can execute to provision a VM. And you know, one shell script might set up a database, another shell script might sync source code, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we make little tweaks all the time, and then there's a major change over during what we call um, co line cutover. So basically, the Salesforce product is released three or four times a year. And so, on those boundaries, then we make um, pretty massive or pretty big changeovers. Um, uh, well, the, all the VMs are actually provisioned basically continuously over the whole course of the day. Um, and. Oh, every night. Yes, so I haven't um, shown all the details of all the auto builds, but um, there's builds that happen continuously as part of the system, and we have an artifact-based system, so the build generates an artifact, and then that gets propagated into all the uh, test runtimes. We basically have like a release management team um, that, uh, that monitors the builds, and um, uh, sort of identifies which change lists are, you know, kind of labels the change lists. Uh, okay, so I'm going so to pass off to Greg here. We're sure. going to talk about Selenium. So I'll speak about the last part of the architecture, and then I'll get into Jenkins and how we're using that. Um, so, like I mentioned before, um, we have a single application server, JVM, that's running um, both the app code and some test code. And when we run Selenium tests, um, this actually goes into a whole other, um, I guess, architecture whereby w when you extend like a Selenium-based test or when you pass the right incantation, then a, a second VM spins up. I think we have about 1,500 of these in addition to the 2,000 or so that we have on site. and then plus the elasticity. I don't know if Selenium is running in the, in the cloud yet, in the Amazon no, cloud? No. Okay. Um, and so e essentially, this will make a remote web driver call, and um, I guess all the Selenium VMs are running Windows XP or Windows 7. Um, and so inside of those, we can run IE6789, um, Firefox latest, Chrome latest, and Safari 5. Uh, I don't think we're on Safari 6 yet. Um, and um, so we have a full, I guess, Selenium browser compatibility suite. So there's a certain number of tests that are, I guess, very basic tests um, that test each part of the UI and that, that make sure that it's going to work in every single one of these browsers. Um, Internet Explorer is about 55% of our traffic because um, it's all enterprise customers and overwhelming majority coming from Windows, maybe over 90% or approaching 90% um, and a little bit now from mobile too. Um, and so I guess one of the problems here, we have a lot of Selenium 1 debt, things that we need to clean up, tests that don't need to be run as often, or um, tests that are kind of testing redundant things. And so I guess we're doing a lot of deleting there and also, um, you know, I guess recreating things in the page object model and with WebDriver. Um, we were very lucky to get um, Jim Evans. He's a Selenium committer. Uh, he's based out of Tampa, Florida, and he's starting to help us now with um, some really cool things, uh, I guess, in the web driver space, especially with headless browser testing, but I'll speak about that a little bit later. Um, I mean, this, the state of UI testing is really difficult right now, I think. You've got Chrome releasing every six weeks, and then Google and Mozilla are next to each other over here on the Embarcadero, and so they had a little meeting, and they said, okay, we're gonna release Firefox every six weeks, too, and we'll do it on a split cadence, right? So every three weeks, you get a new browser coming out, and then also you have Selenium library updates to kind of get the web driver working properly in those things. And they try and maintain, I guess, compatibility with the Selenium 1 API, but things break and then, you know, Tom ends up with 50,000 failures and a large headache. <laughs> um, so that, that's a difficult thing to manage right now for us. Um, 
yeah, n not fun, I guess. And then Internet Explorer and Windows are also extremely difficult. I mean, it seems like, okay, well, you just got four browsers, what's the problem? Um, but it's really not, right? There's Windows 7 running in 64-bit mode. There's Windows 7 running in 32-bit mode. There's 64-bit mode with a 32-bit browser. And we see regressions and customer cases and serious problems that really, um, it's a lot of business to us in, in dollars for these customers if we break something like that. And so just trying to catch these things is a, is a full-time job. Um, so, I mean, what have we just showed you over the last uh, 15 minutes or so? Um, essentially, we're getting extremely great coverage at very great cost. Um, we're able to run this $3 billion a year business and confident re release, um, but it is quite difficult for you to kind of shepherd a change list through the system. Um, just imagine you leave at 6 p.m. or something like that, you send some change list in and you, know, you start thinking about the next task you're gonna work on in your scrum, and you come back the next day and you see all these um, problems blow up in your face that you had all these test failures and you know the, the cycle times, just that six hours in between means you have to go back and then really get involved in this change list again for a day when you thought you were finished with it. Or worse, you broke something, you're not gonna revert it, but you're gonna do you know, two more change lists to try and fix it. Um, and so th this is probably the opposite of continuous delivery. Um, so I guess we're trading that off, but we're getting the confident releases and we have an extremely high renewal rate. Customers are happy that we haven't broken them. Many times they're not as interested in new features as they are in their business still working in them, still being able to sell. Um, and so another consequence of this, you know, we have a very large uh, QA management structure and some of them kind of get stuck with the un enviable task of, okay, well you had 140,000 tests in this run, we're ready to do a release now for a patch or a major release or whatever, but we still see 0 0.1 of tests were failing, right? You got to 99.99, but that's still several hundred tests. So having to go and find those teams and ask those people, is this really a problem or is that just a flapper and undeterministic thing? Can we release with this? Do you sign off? Um, and then another huge problem, I guess, is that with a code base this large, you can change something um, pretty small that you don't think affects anything, uh, or you th thought that you tested it down the line. And I mean, it could be something major, like changing the query builder or query language SQL, or it could just be changing something uh, like in the servlet container, and you don't realize that you broke analytics doing this, and so you're not running those tests and you kind of hose up the whole system. Um, so how do you even figure out, you know, is my run or is my change was likely to cause these kinds of errors? Um, so I guess let's start from the other side. Um, right now, Salesforce can't do a release without Jenkins. Um, so we're releasing the, the major core product, right, the, the sales cloud and the service cloud um, with the infrastructure that Tom's worked on for so many years. Um, but Jenkins really from from the edges has started to kind of encroach into this circle. Uh, we have over 100 teams in R&D, and I think about 40 of them right now are using this. Um, so we're releasing sites, um, data.com, I guess all of our mobile, and um, if you haven't checked out the Salesforce Touch platform yet, you really should. That's something new that we announced at Dreamforce. It's really cool. Essentially, you have wrappers around um, iOS and Android, so that from a JavaScript library that you can kind of access the native features. So it's like a container for both of those. Um, mobile platforms. Um, we release our Outlook product and there's probably 35 other things that are just internal services that are not really exposed as products that we're continuously um, testing and releasing with the help of Jenkins. Um, so really big users of that. Um, so something that we're trying to work on um, in earnest is um, developer productivity. Um, and what we're doing is Jenkins satellite builds. So instead of waiting um, six hours to find out if you cause major test failures in some far off module, um, one of our developers working remotely created this really great script that in about three minutes, it will go ahead and check out the entire Salesforce product, um, start building it, set up a database for you. Um, you know, things that would take a junior developer maybe three days to even learn how to do or a week to learn how to do. This now happens almost automatically for you. And the idea is that instead of passing something up into the main line or into the patch branch or wherever, that you can sort of send it locally to the other box under your desk or the box that your team is sharing and sort of get some feedback on that change list, whether it's good or not. Um, I think that this is, excuse me, super important um, in terms of actually keeping the main line and all your code lines actually releasable. 
Meaning you shouldn't just say, well, this change list looks risky, but we'll just send it to the auto builds and see what happens, see if I break anything. Um, a much more mature thing to do, or a much better thing for the entire process, is to kind of send it locally and sort of stage it before you go ahead and commit it into the main line. Um, so this has been working pretty well for us so far. Uh, additionally, you can get extra information, uh, I guess, about your particular run. Um, and also, maybe if your team has more strict um, static analysis rules and sort of code style rules, that you can sort of catch those before you actually push them out into the, into the main line with everything else. So this is what that script looks like. Uh, it's extremely simple. You just literally, on the bottom here, we have an internal GitHub instance, and you just git clone this PBNJ um, project. You run this, I think it's a make script. You run this installer. It sets up a database for you, gets everything going, and then in about three minutes, you go to your browser and it pops this up on your machine. And now um, it's going and you, essentially you've got that entire auto build system under your desk on a $5,000 desktop. Um, and you can kind of get the same results and sort of compare your results and run them in isolation. If you're trying to especially hunt down a flapper or an undeterministic test and you just want to see, okay, well what if it's just my test running on everyone else's tests? Um, you can get a lot of insight about this and also kind of see over time you know, just for the tests that I own, is this getting worse or better over the course of the release? And so you can kind of draw your own metrics. Um, something else that's really cool that we just started working on, uh, I mentioned that problem before of like, you know, if I make this butterfly effect kind of change, am I going to see something break across the world? Um, we did this thing where we, I guess, linked up our code coverage um, reports. And so basically, you can in this web service, um, take the name of any class or any particular package that you're working on and the things in a change list and figure out what tests you'd actually need to run to, um, you know, to, to, to see if that's going to pass or not. Um, so that, that this is kind of like a, a very early science for us that I think we'll get more state of the art with it over time where um, you can even look at, well, what were the major incidents that we had last year with um, having to roll back a patch or something that went wrong? Was there a test in the system that we could have run before we released this? Um, and starting to really apply data science to all the test data we have. I mean, if you could just imagine for running 140,000 tests a day times 200 change lists, how much raw data that really spits out. Um, we're not using it meaningfully yet, but we're starting to. And um, we're sticking that all in HBase and doing these analytics. And so um, it's something that I think maybe a year from now we'll have a lot more talk about as far as the state of the art is concerned. Um, so like Tom mentioned, we have a multi-million wide code base. And um, some people have done really well with, I guess, breaking their entire um, new service out into a module. Uh, one good example is maybe like the streaming API. It doesn't have many up the chain um, dependencies. And so it sort of exposes itself to a service in the rest of the application. And so um, the tests for that particular module are isolated, meaning you could actually um, take that code, move it off to the side, run the tests on Jenkins for it, and then let's say you get to 100% pass rate that you'd automatically cut a jar, which Ivy would then sync down, and now you'd have a new version of streaming. And essentially, you'd be kind of like building to snapshot uh, for the entire release. And then when you decide that you're at some release boundary, then you start to version it. Um, so I think that's where uh, I'd like to see the entire code base go. And then I think that number of, well, we need to run 250 change lists a day and batch them off because they don't have enough capacity. I think that we'd be in much better shape there because you'd be saying, oh, well, we actually had, um, you know, something like whatever, 100 or 50 major changes to the system for the entire day and that we can use the legacy auto build infrastructure um, to just run and certify if in aggregate everything's okay, but really don't push garbage to the main line. Just keep committing code. That's really important to keep submitting change lists every hour, several times a day, whatever. Um, but not to actually run the full set of 100,000 integration tests until you're actually ready to release. Um, something else that we've been exploring was um, what I like to call Jenkins as a service, meaning um, in some cases it's sort of silly to put Jenkins on a box under your desk because IT can say you lease it up and take your box away from you person leaves the company um, and sort of like that history and those results sort of disappear. Um, and so we did talk quite a bit with CloudBees about a hosted solution 
uh, Jim McLaughlin and I <laughs> spent a lot of time on the phone talking about that. And um, you know, it is difficult because we have two huge data centers that we use for our high availability auto build architecture. And then also, when you talk about the EC2 side of the house, um, those EC2 instances can't even talk directly to the internet. They proxy back through our data center and then out to the net. Um, and so it was kind of a question of, well, are we going to take CloudBee's great intellectual property and deploy it inside of VMs that we manage? Or um, we're, we're still filling that out right now. Um, what we do have working is um, you know, those ad hoc swarms, meaning if you have several teams on platform and they're all using that PB&J Jenkins instant install, when they fire up a swarm, they can actually all um, sort of work together and join the same pool. Is anyone using Jenkins Swarm? Um, yeah, so it, it, it's kind of cool. It, it's basically a way of um, Jenkins instances discovering each other locally on a network. And so the idea is that if my team is on a, um, I don't know, sailing team building day, and we're not using our Jenkins box, that another team on the platform could actually use our spare capacity. Um, another third option that we might pursue is kind of a Salesforce R&D hosted meeting, get a big rack of 15 servers in the data center and sort of run this Jenkins as a service where you don't need to worry about infrastructure and architecture that you just can log in with your LDAP credentials and add a job arbitrarily and you know that a year from now it'll be running. But again, that requires a staff and people to actually shepherd it and make sure it's still working. Um, and something else we're doing, I guess, on that same Jenkins PB and J, you can get great metrics, like I mentioned. You can get um, C static analysis failures, C um, code coverage. The question about your options is yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that would be a thing where you had to keep adding to it, so it wouldn't be elastic, and maybe you'd end up back with another cloud solution. <laughs> um, so yeah, th th there's, there's limitations to that. Um, we, we used to have these really big instances called blitzes that we would use for manual testing. I think that was much closer to 2005 than, than now, and they sort of have lost their purpose in some ways. Um, and mostly now people are using Jenkins desks under their box to run thousands of automated tests against these instances every day, and so I thought that, you know, if you have the blitz as an HA infrastructure, why are we subject to, you know, uh, power loss problems and other things that make tests flat or non-deterministic? So how many maximum number of slaves or jobs you have on one instance right now? On one instance of Jenkins? Uh, th there's no centralized management, so people are doing their own thing on every single one. Um, so Salesforce has been thinking about these problems for an extremely long time. Um, I guess some of the corpus of our work is um, you know, represented in the number of patents that we have, regardless of how controversial software patents are. Um, we've just been working on this you know, forever. I think Tom probably has some patents. And I don't know, anyone who has a great testing idea and starts to implement it, you quickly file something provisional for it. Um, but I guess a lot of this doesn't really matter. It's just a defensive patent or something. Um, I think we're not even close to where we sort of need to be. Um, I mean, one thing is, you know, we're running a platform, right? And so we tell customers you can do anything you want on here. You can, you know, run your business. And every three months, um, if you, you can look at it, actually, the way that I find out is through like the profile of the heap in the JVM. I can see that we're not optimized for the thing that we optimized for a year ago because our customers are starting to do different kinds of workloads on our service. Um, and so, like, a build anything platform is extremely hard to test. If you say, hey, you have your whole controller language, you have your whole database language, and you have your whole um, UI language or view language. Um, people do some interesting things, and just all kinds of different things start to creep in there. Um, I think Tom has a project to work on much smarter VM provisioning. Right. Yeah. Um, I really think that, um, you know, obviously, I think 35,000 Selenium 1 tests is completely ridiculous, and I have half a mind to kind of delete half of them or all of them, and then kind of build back up holistically to, until we get the coverage number that we want. Um, I think one thing we're doing to mitigate that is headless UI testing. So within the same Linux server VM as the application server, um, you can run an HTML unit driver. Um, HTML unit with JavaScript on is just, a, I guess, a browser simulation of sorts. Um, and you can kind of get functional UI testing instead of um, like end-to-end -end UI testing. Or you can even run um, 
Firefox in like a headless mode in Linux. And um, it does run about 30% faster than regular Firefox if you had brought it up in a windowing system. Um, and something else that we're really excited about is um, PhantomJS, which is another uh, purposely designed headless browser. But it has something called Ghost Driver, which is an implementation of the web driver um, interface. Um, and that's really, really fast, even faster than Chrome. Um, so we may be able to get speed out of those tests if we have to have them. Um, something else kind of interesting is what if you did an in-memory database? What if you had like a, a very large machine with a lot of memory and you're able to just not really have disk on those machines if you're able to run an entire test run of Salesforce, let's say, um, right into memory? Or if you go the other way, so maybe that would just be for like basic tests or kind of um, what we call like pre-check-in tests. Uh, what if you went the other way? What if you took something that was really cheap, like ARM hardware, or Intel's copy of that, Intel Atom hardware, which is like 100 bucks a board, and you made a whole entire like server rack of that, like a 42 rack to the ceiling, you probably fit 2,000 VMs in there. And what if you ran kind of your longer integration test on something like that that really didn't cost as much as the multi-million dollar audible infrastructure? Um, something that's very interesting to me. Um, I guess if you think any things are interesting, if you wanna work on problems like this, you should come talk to us about um, working at Salesforce and working on automation, because it's really super, I don't know. I feel like no one else in the world is working on something this big. Um, I think we're even a little bigger than Sauce Labs in terms of our UI testing, and um, it's a fascinating place to solve problems, and everyone's so busy that when you walk in, you'll go, well, why is this broken? Why is no one fixing this? And you can really make a name for yourself pretty quickly and start fixing it.